Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking about the fantastic film Tar. We are joined today by writer, director, and producer Todd Field, cinematographer Florian Hofmeister, editor Monica Willey, composer Hildur Gudnadotter, and re-recording mixer Deb Adair. And, and Todd, I wanted to start by asking a little bit about the way in which you gradually open up the world of Tar and the way that you've told this story and how that influences a lot of the directing choices and a lot of the craft choices, because we start at the beginning of the film getting to see her on stage with the with the New Yorker interview so we get to know how she's seen and perceived in the world professionally by audiences um, then we start to kind of go a little bit behind the scenes of her professional life and getting to see dynamics with colleagues how, you know how is she with the orchestra what does it look like when she's teaching a class you know and then we kind of open up a little bit further into her personal world as you know a partner and as a mother and other aspects of that and so I was interested in in how that kind of gradually shifted and opened up the choices that you were making when you were writing, directing, and making a lot of the craft choices for the film and how you wanted to open up these different layers, both visually and narratively? Um, well, as you as you state, um, we, we, we see different faces of her. Um, I mean, the film begins in a sort of, uh, in the same way that a, you know, a, a Elizabethan play would, would start, which is a, a young soldier, uh, a spot comes on on a, on a sleeping figure on, on, on the stage and maybe a, a foot soldier comes up and maybe just brushes the hilt of his dagger. Maybe it's nervous. Maybe he's planning on plunging that into the belly of the sleeping king. You don't know. And then you go to black and then the play begins. Um, uh, so there's an expectation that um, uh, not everybody knows what's going on and there's a very particular point of view, even though we don't know who that that point of view belongs to. The very first scene um, is fairly objective in so much as we have a private moment with this character in the wings. Um, and we can tell that there's something going on with her um, in terms of um, uh, sort of the percolation of expectation for her and what's involved in some of her allergies and, um, and rituals and uh, superstitions involved with uh, having to perform in public and it is a performance, the next scene. Um, she's performing Lydia Tarr. Um, it has really nothing to do with who she really is. It's a, it's a sort of amalgamation of many years of careful study involving um, a way in which she wants to be perceived and wants to be heard. Um, every turn of phrase and the tone of her voice and uh, her biography that's being trotted out and, it's clearly been crafted by her uh, and Francesca, the, the, her assistant, the very least, if not a PR team. Um, some of that's real, some of it's hyperbolic, and some of it's absolute nonsense. Um, uh, and then we meet her in this uh, sort of transactional, um, a different transaction than, than this PR situation, which is with her um, uh, uh, sort of um, um, patron. You know, who is this uh, want to be amateur conductor who's bought himself on his way onto the podium that she has to do a fair amount of business with? Um, but we're still sort of at arm's length with her. We're still still fairly objective. We're still watching her. Um, and then we see her in this Juilliard classroom, and it's really the first time um, that things change. It's the first time we hear music, which is important. It's the first time the camera moves, which is important. Um, um, and those two things are there to serve a purpose. The music is obvious because it's, it's illustrating something that she's going to use to, uh, as a tool to, to make a point. Um, and, uh, and the camera moving is for a purpose in so much as she has to control the tempo in that scene. Um, uh, in terms of the craft of those two things, um, and, and all of these things, but let's just focus on that scene for a moment so that other people can have a chance to talk. Uh, uh, that scene has um, a musical component to it. It has a um, craft cinematography component to it, which is we have 36 to 40 setups, depending on how you define the setup, that have to be involved in that, um, you know, involved in that, um, in that one shot. Um, there's an acting component, obviously. Um, there's a sound component. Uh, for 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 Deb, um, and there's also um, uh, an editorial component in so much as that we had twelve or thirteen takes to try to look at and think about um, 
So uh, there's a huge amount of, of craft involved in that, but we're, st we're still keeping her at her arm's length. The first time that we really have any access to her at all, um, other than these sort of lonely moments with her um, in the following two scenes is, is when she's home, when she wakes up at home and she's brushing her teeth, you know, um, and she's not done up and she's not in a tailored suit. Um, and her hair is in her face and, and, and she's, you know, to use a, a, a really tired word, she's relatable, you know, it feels like a privilege, like, oh, okay, she's okay. Or with, now, now, oh, she's a normal person. She goes to the bathroom, she brushes her teeth, she does the things that we all do. Um, so it felt like a, 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 it felt important to be able to meet her in all of these areas of her life to see what it is that, um, uh, what the stakes are frankly and and to and to understand that she knows her stuff uh, even if we don't understand what her stuff is that she knows her stuff i love that you know and and florian off, off the back of the way that that Ted, that todd's describing all of that there's there's such an artistic element to the very specificity of where the camera is and how often it moves and the way that the character really dictates that you know if we look at the the Juilliard teaching scene which I believe was originally going to be you know when you and Todd first started shot listing there was the you know it was like we could have the camera here and then it could move here then we see the student's perspective and in the end it's it's this singular take where the character is really dictating where we go and so it feels like Lydia is always the dictation of how we how we see and receive her through the camera where it's placed you know how many different places or angles you want to have with the camera and there's there's a lot of subtlety and restraint in a lot of ways that you've used the camera which also comes with its own nuances so I was interested in in working with Todd and figuring out a lot of the setups and using character to dictate those choices um how you know how you created a lot of those choices and decisions that went into those moments where almost less is telling us so much more but everything that goes into those moments behind the scenes yeah <laughs> just like just like this panel we sit together and we listen i just thought the you know todd's answer was just so beautiful it brought back so many memories of the time we spent together so i'm 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 uh, partly having to sort myself <clears throat> uh the, the one thing i two things i can add to this uh one is i think you just said uh, yes we did have an idea of many different uh, shots that we wanted to approach in that uh scene at juliet's but it was always very clear from the beginning and correct me todd if i remember this wrongly that it was always meant to be a singular traveling camera we were just very adamant that um it wasn't meant to be you know like a a circus show where you show off your muscular abilities as uh you know look how we can unleash the camera but there were moments where we wanted to be and had to be we had to be close to her when she was playing piano you want to be more intimate you want to be further back when you saw the stage so those were the conversations but it was always clear there was one uh singular shot and and what then happens is once i think those ideas come you know entering the the um uh, shared creativity, then uh, a lot of my responsibilities or how I define my work would be to see how we can actually pull this off. And the particular location presented, you know, tremendous changes in the way it was like this bunker-esque um, studio. So how to actually be able to move the camera in this room that took a lot of consideration. And uh, But the idea was there from the very start. And um, I found in the entire process that the idea uh, was there from the very start and we just you know followed it <laughs> and that's what i personally gives me a, a great feeling of um um satisfaction and uh yeah i'm really proud of this because the idea was there from the start and then we just we just did it i'm sorry <laughs> can't say more <laughs> No, that's so great. You know, and, and and Monica, you know, similarly to to the details that that Todd was describing as well, in terms of of how we start to see the character in one way, and then we open up and we see these different facets, and we open up her world. You know, that also influences a lot of the choices that you're then making in post production and editing, in terms of how you're bringing us into the frame, what choices you're making in terms of takes that you're using. Um, you know, particularly because this story, especially as things start to to and thread around her is told in a way where it's not dictating to the audience how they should respond to this. It's allowing a place for open interpretation. Um, and so how did trying to, you know, 
open up her world, but also allow, you know, in essence, almost like a neutrality for the audience to make their own determinations influence a lot of the choices that you were making in post-production. Uh, yeah, you were just describing very well the way we were working. I, I mean, the material I got that we had in the in the cutting room was pretty much determined by the script and by the decisions they have done on set. I, we were not drowning in, in numerous uh, possibilities. Um, and Lydia Tarr and her way was always the center of, of, of our storytelling, uh, following her, but also, as you said, giving a lot of or enough reflection room for the audience to, to be with her and to bring yourself in and and have your own perspective on in the situations. I love that. And and Hilda, with the with the music composition, there's almost three elements to what you had to do for this film, and they all really influence each other. So beyond what we even hear externally, there's an entire soundtrack that you composed for for the actors and and for the characters, you know, because especially with with Lydia. It's this thing where she she thinks and feels and moves to music. You know, even the fact that you know, I, I think you and Todd had her walking to 120 beats per minute, and that's the pace of her as a character a lot of the time. But then maybe there's another character that that thinks and moves and and moves in the world at like 60 beats per minute. Um, you know, and that in turn then influences the way that she approaches music composition and and everything that we're hearing in that way. And then there's the further element of then you have the soundtrack of the movie on top of that. Um, and so I was interested in in just that that scope of really approaching a project like this where you're you're thinking in three different strands of how you're composing music and the way that one would then influence the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was it was incredibly interesting. It was it was. Um, uh, let me just be be totally um, blocked about it. it was probably the most interesting for me <laughs> because because this is this is you know my my world you know and I'm, I'm sure um, you know Mona would feel the same if, if she got to do a film about editing you know it's just like it's really fun to get to do um, a, 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 you know oh, I'm sure Mona had a lot of fun as well I'm not, not <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's, uh, it's, it was just really, really fun for me to get to dig into, into the process of making music because we have, you know, we have loads of musicals. We've had, you know, lots of, you know, films or, or stories where, where music is, is um, important. But I, I think it's this is the only... Um, only opportunity that I've had at least to dig into the process of making it because I, it's it's so rare that we get to be in rehearsals and and we get to we get to be with a kind of psychological turmoil it is to to create to write something you know and and, and it's not the finished concert or the album or or the um you know the tada moment never happens. You know it's it's the it's like the how do you go there? Like what what's happening when you're on the way there? Like you're not even and, and you never you never get there. You know, which I think is fantastic because I think as a as a musician that is for me that is the music. Like that is the whole juice of the making of music is the process and and uh, that's the part that I'm most interested in and. Um, so it was a real treat for me to get to to get to do this and and um and it was just so <clears throat> interesting on so many levels as you say because because um we have you know we have like we you know the rehearsals are very important and they take up a lot of space and they should take up a lot of space because they're a huge part of the whole the whole storyline this persona that she's creating then we have the music that she's writing, which is a completely different part of the story because that's the part that kind of shows her vulnerable side, you know, her her the the the, the doubts she has of herself as a creative person, and then there's the, the then there's the kind of her her um, demeanor, how how she is in in the world, which I find as a musician, like what I'm writing really influences you know my whole day-to-day -day 
life both in in waking and sleeping you know it, it, it you know i can wake up in the middle of the night and i'm totally over taken by something that i'm writing so i think this this internal tempo that you're experiencing as as you're writing or or, or rehearsing is very very important so so i thought it was just really important to 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 have that as an actual part of the whole process that we're on we're on like the filmmakers because obviously we're influencing a lot of how all of this works that we are all hearing the music that that she's experiencing internally um and we can bring that into her demeanor we can bring that into the cinematography and the editing and the and the and the sound you know because that is how it works when you're actually writing you know and that's was a phenomenally uh, fun way of of uh, of working and and um, yeah you know there's there's a lot to be said but it was it was a fantastic fantastic journey that's amazing and 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 Deb there there's kind of two different elements at play in terms of the intricacies of what you it sounds like you and the rest of the the sound team were dealing with on this project and and one is when you have multiple channels and and mul- multiple different sounds you know scenes like the rehearsals with the orchestra where there's microphones placed throughout the room there's several different feeds and there's dialogue on top of that and then there's the opposite end of the spectrum where there's some scenes that are very very quiet and yet this and so the sound needs to be incredibly specific because any tiny minute thing the audience is going to be so aware of it and it's going to influence the way that they respond to that scene so much and so what were some of the different challenges and intricacies of you know editing a more complex scene in terms of the amount of sound and the the amount of different things that you were playing with and and determining what you wanted the audience to see and key into at different moments as opposed to some of the quieter scenes where there's maybe less different specific sounds but the impression that we get from them is so much more connected well just to um add to what Hilda was saying, um, it, it was an amazing experience to work on this film because of those elements. And um, Todd and Mona um, laid out a very specific roadmap when they edited the picture. And then Stephen Griffiths and his team um, did an amazing job working with that roadmap. And for me to be able to sit down with what Stephen had done and Hilda's score, and to be able to put it all together was just a, an amazing experience. And even though there was a very specific roadmap, there was a certain amount of discovery that happened on the dub stage. And um, just exactly what you were saying, the the, the difference between um, the, the big rehearsal moments with the score and then the quieter moments where um, is she hearing that buzz from the refrigerator or is it just in her mind? Where's it coming from? So um, we really had, um, we had a really good time playing around with those elements. <laughs> and and Todd, kind of going back to some of what Hilda was saying about the, the different rhythms and the different beats and intonations of, of the characters, you know, with the fact that you had that that concept early on about creating internal music composition for the characters and the way that they move, it feels like you've told this film in a way where you have such a specific sense in the writing and in how you've directed scenes of what the rhythm and pacing of every single moment is going to be in every single moment for Lydia as a character. Um, and so even in the writing stage, how is that influencing the way that you were starting to craft out scenes and the way that you were thinking about rhythm in telling a story about a music composer? Um, well, I think a lot of people that write um, listen to music when they write. Um, I've heard other people talk about this. Um, uh, some of my fiction writer friends just listen to pink noise, you know, like John Franzen famously just puts the pink noise in. Uh, but I always listen to music. And if I can find a track that works, I, I may play that track continually for three months um, and with very little, unless it starts to be too much and I'll try to break it up. And the track, you know, one of the first questions that Hilder asked me um, was, what were you listening to when you wrote the script? Were you listening to anything? And I was. I was listening to this Goreshki piece, um, and and so we shared, you know, music back and forth. And and that piece is 120 beats per minute. And so Hilder said, "Okay, so that's her pace because if that's what you're listening to, clearly that's how you're feeling about the character." Um, 
And uh, and that was absolutely right. You know, um, I wasn't aware of it until Hilder pointed at it and said, that's important, you know. Um, now let's go through and let's map the entire script. You know, let's, let's actually, she said, let's spot the film, <laughs> you know. And I said, well, we can't, we haven't made the film. She said, no, 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 we have the script. Let's spot, let's go through and spot it. And let's make some decisions about how she moves, when she moves, um, where there's score, what is that score supposed to be doing? Why is it there? Um, and and why is it not there, you know? Um, and so we were very lucky, you know, we uh, from soup to nuts, we had a 14 month process. That's a gigantic luxury. And that's mainly because Hilder decided that that was going to be the process. She wasn't, you know, she, she wasn't she we, she wasn't paid for fourteen months, um, but but <laughs> but but she was working for fourteen months, um, and I would say that um, for everyone that is speaking, you know, today, you know, that we're talking to, you know, um, from from Florian to to Monica to to Deb, you know, which is that everybody really showed up and um, gave it their all, you know, um, and I know everyone does when they work on a picture, but. This was a particularly challenging film um, with a lot of moving parts. Um, and of course, there's never enough time and never enough money. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very generous for Florian to say that there were a lot of decisions made. And yes, there were, you know, or for Mona to say that or for Deb to say that. But um, there, there are decisions that you make at a writing desk and then there's decisions that you make once you start dancing with people. And I had the greatest dance partners that anyone could ever want to have, you know? Um, uh, if any one of these artists, these filmmakers were different, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. That's so wonderful. And, and Monica and Deb, you know, Deb, you were touching upon there, like how much of an amazing roadmap Monica and her team were giving you. And, and, and Monica, I've heard you say that, that part of the post-production process was that you would really work to finesse and hone in a specific scene and make sure that it was in the right place before moving on to the next one. And, and just between the dynamic and the way that you and both of your teams were working, I was interested in just hearing a little bit more about what that collaboration looked like between post-production and between sound design, because they're so intrinsic in the way that they're coming together in the telling of this story? Uh, thought is a, it was a really fantastic collaboration and um, the most beautiful part, I think, or one of the most beautiful parts is that Todd and I, we, we both agreed that we work on a scene as long as we think that in that moment of time, it's really right. So that we that we didn't move on and said, yeah, let's let's keep it the way it is and let's come back two days later, but really try to 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 make to make it as perfect as it would be possible. Not meaning that we wouldn't change then a month later, but uh, that also included a lot of sound work and that we did on our own. So including recording foley's and uh, and really working with. Um, a lot of takes to to get the best out of the dialogue that we could get, uh, but also to send a lot of scenes to our sound team, to Stephen and Andy, so that they could work on it, also work on the dialogue, filtering it, uh, putting ambiences on it that were needed and send it back to us so that we would have an idea how it could sound in the, in the very end, which which made what Todd is really doing to, to, to precise the preciseness to be really on point. And for you, Deb? Yeah, to, to Mona's point, um, Stephen and his team, Andy Shelley, did an amazing job with the, uh, especially with the dialogue for, for my part. Um, uh, cutting together all the best moments and takes. And um, we really wanted to um, be true to the acoustics, to every environment that was shot in. So we relied a lot more on boom mics than um, ISOs in order to keep those acoustics real. That's wonderful. And, and, and Florian, in terms of, of the way that you were shooting this, there's so many different 
kind of tones and feels and atmospheres in terms of the different environments, you know, the the way that you've lit and captured Lydia's apartment gives us a very different connection to that that scene and things that take place there as opposed to the music calls or, you know, being in someone's office that's clearly the office that they live in and work in and sleep in and have been in for, for decades. And so how did you set about allowing each of the locations and all of the production design elements that were going into that dictate the the tone and aesthetic and visual aspects of how you then wanted to capture it with the camera? Well, I mean, I think like in his opening um, explanations, you know, Todd um, touched on these two things called, I, I guess, objectivity is one term and authenticity is something that then comes to my mind. So, the lighting at the on on a on a first level, the lighting had to absolutely uh, the the live up to authenticity of space. It was just like unquestionable. We could never, you know, there's a, a beautiful phrase to get caught. You know, we, it it had to be absolutely believable. So to to have this immersive uh, um, uh, feeling for an audience to be there, it had to be completely authentic and believable. That was number one. And then number two, um, there was a bit of a uh, uh, maybe a, a theme that I had running parallel to that is uh, what Todd had described about you know Lydia as a character being you know in in her say world of appearance where she performs her own narrative or in the world of being that Hilda touched on you know like the inti- yes. intimacy of uh, creation, and I try to to distinguish between those two poles in lighting. So I mean, some of it is yeah. again comes back to authenticity of space. When you're on a stage, you're lit. You're more, you know. So there's a, a stronger key light, and there's a, more the feeling of presence. And then when you're by yourself, you know, we try to keep a more in an open shadow and more intimate in a way. Those were the the elements that we kind of bounce backwards and forwards. So and it's actually interesting, just now when. Um, you guys described the first scene. Um, uh, I, I actually had completely forgotten that. Of course, she starts in the wings and she is in an open shadow, you know, and you can really be with her. And then she steps on and she sits, you know, there with Adam Gopnik. So those were the themes we were uh, 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 bouncing along. Of course, uh, the film is mostly shot on location. So then, you know, that there was in, in prep was one probably of the most important parts of our prep was just finding those and when we revisited them uh and when we when we saw them first with Todd it was like interesting for me to see how he reacted to things and what were important to him so it was a puzzle that was built continuously uh, put together by the design the choice of the uh, locations and then you know the the lighting that we put on top of it absolutely but I want to say something I have to say one thing because he was so generous he's a very generous man but uh, <laughs> I, have to, I have to put this on the record because I think that, um, you know, I was contemplating about how different the positions are that we all met Todd, you know, and, and um, um, I'm, of course, um, at the bit of the, the production where, where, we are, where we are live. You know, I can't really go back and, and change things. You know, of course you can to an extent, but we were under the pressure of those 50 plus days that we were shooting on. And some people they whatever compared you know sometimes filmmaking with um with um the war i always thought that's a very inappropriate um um inappropriate um uh, uh choice i always find you jumping down the abyss that is more how i sometimes feel when you get to the set in the morning and you know okay now we're going there is a sense of failure is absolutely possible <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh <laughs> and then at times, so when you jump down into the abyss, sometimes you jump voluntarily, and sometimes there might be a little hand pushing you. And I, at times, I felt who pushed me, and I while I was falling down the abyss, I looked up, and it was Todd who would then jump right after me. He jumped right after me, and whilst we were falling down, I would say, um, you know, I, I metaphorically, I'd say, so what are we going to do? And he would say, we'll grow wings. And I think, you know, that's really, <clears throat> from my perspective, in our creative process, what happened, that is, you really allowed us to grow wings. So, you know, that's I'm forever beautiful. grateful. Thank you. Thank you for it. Oh, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Just a very generous thing to say. And, and lastly, Todd and Hilda, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about 
some of the music that goes in a little bit of a different direction for Lydia, which is the moment of apartment for sale. And in essence, it's it's such a moment of being able to release the tension in one way, but then builds this very other type of tension for the character as well with where she's at emotionally and with everything that's fractured for her at that point. Um, and so I was just interested a little bit in in the genesis of Apartment for Sale as a piece within <laughs> the film and really what you wanted it to communicate about the character in that moment. Well, that okay, Apartment for Sale, poor, poor Mona, you know, Mona would wake up in the middle of the night screaming because she it was like listening, it was like being forced to watch children's programming you know uh with this with a young person and you wake up listening to um some earbug uh from uh you know a saturday morning cartoon um apartment for sale um and without revealing too much it's always dangerous to talk about these things really came out of we were trying to find some sort of sensible loss of control for her um and we had many options on the table for that. And Mona, um, Florian, uh, and uh, Hilder, and Kate, and the art department, and uh, Mona and I explored many things in terms of what that would be. Um, and the apartment for sale thing really was very, seemed to be the best choice. Um, and it really happened spontaneously, which was, we were about ready to leave that location. And my first AD slash co-producer, Sebastian Barbrooks came up to me and it's hard to talk about Sebastian without the acting Sebastian. So if you'll allow me, he said, Don, the accordion teacher is here. And I said, what? He said, you asked for an accordion teacher back in June. Now this is in you know November. And I said, Oh man, really an accordion teacher? Yeah, yeah, she's here. She's here. So I went and found Kate and I said, Hey, Kate, you know, the accordion teacher is here. And she said, What? What accordion teacher? I said, The accordion teacher, haven't you been studying? Said, no, no. Okay, well, she's here. Go work with her right now. <laughs> so we're all sitting around on set and she goes, Okay, what do you want me to do? You know, and we just set the camera down on the piano in the other room. It's not lined up or anything. We just drop the camera. I think Alex, the camera assistant, we said, like, put the camera over there. I said, just, you're going to come out and you're just going to sing this song. She goes, well, what's the song? And I just gave her some lyrics and then she did it. I think we did two takes and that was it. And we, and, and we were all giggling on set. We never thought we'd probably end up using it. Um, and then ultimately that became sort of the bridge for her, but we had all kinds of other um, uh, things on the table besides that. Um, uh, a, a really beautiful piece of, uh, of, of editing that, that Mona put together that will never see the light of day, but um, it was in and of itself out of context, really quite something. Um, and I'm but I think that's so perfect because I think that's that's, you know, I think, Kate was telling me about the scene once and it feels like it was really the scene where she also personally as an actress let go as well because she was like and then Todd came to me one day and he was like you have to play the accordion and I was like I have to play the fucking accordion like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well she gets she gets to be Tom Waits for a second you know it's like <laughs> 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 I love the details of how that came together along with everything else in the film, the work that you've all done on this, this film and telling the story and capturing this character is so phenomenal. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Mom. Thank you.